All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the DC motor. So the DC motor ultimately is like a transformer. What I do is I put electrical energy into one of the ports and I harvest mechanical energy out of the other port. All right. The goal of the DC machine is basically I put electrical energy in so I can produce torque and make something move. That something usually is a pump or a valve or a pulley or a robot arm or, or, or some, you know, some mass, something like that. All right. The basic principle by which a motor works, any motor, not just a DC motor, but any motor, is what's shown right here, something you learned in physics. Okay, so what I've shown is I've got a battery, right, and I've got a wire connected to that battery. And so what's going to happen is a current's going to flow through that wire. Now, I've also placed that wire between two magnets. All right, so a couple of things. One thing we know is that the current should flow out of the plus node of the battery and should flow back in through the minus node of the battery. One other thing we know is if I have a magnet <coughs> that has a north pole and a south pole, magnetic field lines are always closed, and they're going to go from the north pole to the south pole like that. Well, when I take two magnets and I put them real close together, I put a north pole and a south pole real close together, what's going to happen is the magnetic field lines jump across from the north to the south, like so. All right. <clears throat> so in this case, my B field or magnetic field goes across that gap, and I place that wire in that gap. Now you learned in physics that if I do that, there's a force on that wire, and that force is given by I L cross B. So it's a cross product. It's a vector. Okay. And I said that this this distance here is the length. Okay. Of, of this gap, right? It's the length of, length of the gap that the wire goes through. So if I look at this, if I've got a current I going in like this and a B field going across, I can see that with this, the magnitude of the force, right, will just be I L B, right? The direction of it I determine by doing the right hand rule. So in this particular case, the way I would do the right hand rule is I put my finger in the direction of the current curve my fingers in the direction of the B field, and my thumb points in the direction of the force. So again, I, easier to do that in front of you live, but what that's going to do is the force is going to be such that it yanks the wire upward. Okay, So the wire gets pulled in the upward direction. If I change the direction of the current, the wire would get forced downward. If I change the magnitude of the current, this guy would get pulled up harder. All right. All right, so that's the basic principle by which any motor works. Again, not just a DC motor. But what I always have to do to make a motor work is I have to make a magnetic field and put a current carrying wire into that magnetic field, and then I've got a machine. All right, so this is a cross section of what a typical DC motor might look like. And I'll bring one to class so you can see what this thing sort of looks like once it's taken apart. All right, but essentially what we do is, like, we, like I said back here, is I have to create a magnetic field and place a current carrying wire into that magnetic field. So in this particular case, I've shown one way that you can do that. So one way is I can put a current source here, call it IF, a DC current source. And that DC current source will, will have a current flow into this wire, which is wrapped around a piece of iron. Okay. So that piece of iron, all right, uh, essentially, you know, we've talked about this when we talked about transformers, right? But if I have a wire like this, there's going to be a magnetic field that travels around that wire. And when I wrap that wire around a magnetic piece like this, like iron, it should be the case that the B field flows up through the center of that guy, makes a turn here, all right, and basically goes around in a direction like this, all right? So it comes up through the center of this guy. Now again, you can use the right-hand rule for, for magnetic fields to figure that out. But the key thing of the iron is we said this guy is high mu. All right? If he has high mu, he basically keeps the magnetic field inside. So really the goal of the iron is to be sort of like a conduit to direct the magnetic fields. And particularly where it directs the magnetic field to go is over into this air gap. All right? Where we've placed, if you look at this, there's a current. That's what these are here. These are wires. All right, that are wound around a long cylinder. So I said I'm looking at a cross section. So let's define a couple of things here. All right, what I have is a cross section. So if I if I looked at this thing lengthwise, 
what I would have is a big cylinder, right? Like so. And there would be <coughs> wires running down <coughs> the top side of this guy, like this. So I'd have wires running down the top side, and then I'd have I'd have wires on the bottom side. The length of this thing is L and the this piece in the middle right here is iron and that piece is sometimes called a rotor and this piece out here is sometimes called a stator okay now what's going to happen with this thing a um, couple of couple of things when the when the magnetic field so the magnetic field the whole reason for the iron was to direct the magnetic field over here to where these wires are in reality, <clears throat> there's a gap between this stationary piece called the stator and this rotor piece, this rotational piece in the middle. The gap here is very exaggerated. It tends to actually be much, much smaller than this. But what's going to happen is, if I do this, is the B field is going to jump across perpendicular. It's going to end up going like this. It leaves perpendicular to the top surface and it enters perpendicular to the rotor all right, and it goes across like this and then goes through here and out like this all right and goes across and I'm not showing all the field lines, but there'd be obviously other field lines that these guys would close on themselves. So what I've got is I've got these current carrying wires that are wrapped lengthwise along this rotational piece. Okay. And I've got them placed in a B field. The critical thing is that this thing in the middle is sitting on bearings and it can rotate. Okay. What I typically do in the real world is I hook a voltage source up here. Okay. And I'm going to call this guy VA. And the term A here refers to armature. We sometimes call those windings armature windings. Now I'm going to define a couple of things here. I'm going to say that um, L is the length of the rotor. Okay. I'm going to say R is the radius of the rotor. Okay. And I'm going to say I've got N is the number of turns of wire on the rotor. Okay, So I've got n turns of wire placed on this rotor. All right, now important thing about this is because I'm creating magnetic field with this IF, there's going to be a force on these wires over here inside this magnetic field. Right? And I know that that force I can write as I A L cross B like that. Okay. So in this particular case, right, if I look at the force on any one wire, right, the magnitude is very straightforward. So B here is the strength of the B field coming from this IF guy. Somehow I can relate that directly to IF. So sometimes the way I write that is I'll say, well, the magnitude of this force is I A L B and I can relate that to I F and sometimes I'll say I L and I'll write it as G times I F where G is some constant that depends on geometry and the number of turns of this guy I don't really care about all that stuff right it, it's not all that important to us somehow that's the B field that's created by this field current right? I don't, those details are kind of they don't really help to explain the point right in other words important thing is that this IF is creating this B field and I placed IA into that B field so there's a force on each wire. Now the force is the same on each individual wire. Now what's the direction? So if I do the right hand rule, if I look at the top of this thing, what I have is I have currents coming out on the top and in on the bottom. Okay. <coughs> Before I talk about that, I want to say something real quick about how, how currents get into this thing. This is kind of tricky. You're going to have to see this when we're in class. But basically, I have a voltage source that's hooked up to these wires on the rotor. A current flows from that voltage source into a basically a piece of carbon 
that is connected to a copper strip on this cylinder. So a current can flow from the DC supply through that brush, that piece of carbon, into copper strips on the motor. And what happens is the current flows out on this top wire, so it flows out at you, so it flows lengthwise down, down this uh, rotor. And then it, when it gets to the end, it turns and goes back the other, the other way on the bottom side. And then when it gets there, it comes out on the top on, uh, up here, and then when that gets to the end, it comes, it comes, it goes back down the machine in this wire, and then it comes out at you again here, and then it comes away from you here, and then out at you here, and away from you here, and eventually makes its way over to this end where it flows out of the machine. Okay? So bottom line is as this thing rotates, it's always the case that current's coming out on the top and in on the bottom. All right. So given that that's the case, if I want to figure out the direction on any one of these, well, I said the B field basically hits perpendicular to the surface of this rotor, and I is always coming out. So if I do my right-hand rule, what I'll find is that the direction of the force is always clockwise. It's always tangential to the rotor and in a clockwise direction. So I'm going to draw now those, those force lines. So they can be like this, like that, like that, like that, okay. So I'm gonna have all those forces basically acting tangential to the rotor. If these wires are tightly attached to the rotor, what that means is the rotor itself is going to spin. And because of the way this thing is constructed, as this thing spins, it's always the case that current, current is coming out on the top and going in on the bottom. So that makes this thing rotate. Right? So that's the basic principle of a motor. What I do is I, as I place a current carrying wire into a magnetic field, make sure that that current carrying wire is strapped to something that can move, and I get motion. Right? I, I produce motion from that. So this is the force on any one wire. Right? If I want to say well, the, what, in a rotational system, what I care about is torque. Okay? Torque is the rotational equivalent to, to force. Right? And so what I say is that the torque on this thing. Torque is always related to force times what we call moment arm. Right? Force times the moment arm through which it operates. Think about the ways in which you open doors and things like that. There's some analogies you can make to kind of understand this a little bit better. All right, so um, in this case, if I want to talk about the torque on any one wire, I can see here that that's got to be IALB, which is the force times the radius r. Okay, that's the torque on any one wire. I'm going to call it torque total. Torque total, oops, torque total is I have to sum up across all n of the wires on this thing. So I say I A L B R times n. Now if I unpack that expression for a second, okay, so I say torque total equals IA times L times B times R times N. If I look at that for a second, the length of the machine is a constant. Once it's built, it doesn't change. Same is true with the radius. Same is true with the number of turns. The B field, well, as long as I don't change this current source here, the B field stays constant. Okay? And in most machines, that's the case. Then what I end up having is that the torque is a constant times the current going into it, okay? I call this the sometimes the motor constant. Motor constant, okay? So I get from this, this is one of, I always say that there's really two things you need to know to understand a motor, right? This is the first one of them. The torque produced by a machine is directly proportional to the current that flows into that machine. So now, Go over to here. All right. So now what I'm going to say is for my machine, torque is km i a. Okay. So this is my this is basically my rule number one for machines. Basically, what this says is torque produced is proportional to current. 
Okay. The more current going into the machine, the more torque it gives me. In other words, the harder it can push to make something happen. All right. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Now, again, what I said about this guy is he's sort of like a transformer. Okay. So here's my motor. He's like an electromechanical version of a transformer. So I have a set of terminals where I have VA and IA applied. And then I have a mechanical terminal, okay, which is a shaft that can spin. All right. And on that mechanical terminal, what I have is torque and speed. Okay. So if this thing is a ideal transformer. Okay, if it's an ideal transformer, it should be the case that power in equals power out. So in this case, if the power in is electrical and the power out is mechanical, I should have that. Now, in, in reality, a machine is not ideal, right? We'll deal with what that means in a minute. So P electrical equals P mechanical. So the electrical power is VAIA, all right? Now, mechanical power is similar, right? So in the, in the electrical case, I said voltage times current. In the mechanical case, that's torque times speed, okay? Now, I use from this what I just said over there, which is that torque is related to current. So I can rewrite this as KMIA. So I substitute it for the torque times omega. The IAs cancel, and I get that VA is equal to km omega, okay? This is my second principle, okay? What I say is that voltage, and I'm gonna write this as, uh, so for now I'm gonna say voltage is km omega, okay? <clears throat> voltage is km omega. What I see is that torque and current are directly proportional voltage and speed are directly proportional. So the more voltage I apply to a motor, the faster it goes, okay? Now, because this guy is just like a generator, what, what that sort of means is that he is, um, sorry, because this motor is just like a transformer, right? What that means is it's got a primary terminal, which I've shown here, I guess, as the electrical terminal, and it's got a secondary terminal, which I've shown here as the mechanical terminal. Now, I can also operate it in the other direction. In other words, I could apply energy at the mechanical terminal and get energy out at the electrical terminal. In that case, it would be a generator. So for a generator, right, I would basically have some sort of device that could you know, turn the rotor. And then what would happen? Well, I would measure a voltage at this thing. Okay, I'd measure a voltage at this thing. So what would I do in this case? Well, I'd have some sort of a, a turbine or something, some sort of a some sort of a device that would use steam or gas or you know some some way to basically be able to spin this machine, and I would get a voltage at the terminals. Right? I'll try to sh quickly show that in class. The voltage I would get would be proportional to speed. Okay, so that kind of tells me that the circuit model for this machine looks something like this. Okay. Here's VA. Okay. And this source here is KM omega. So it tells me that if I took a turbine and I tried to spin the machine faster, okay, I would see a voltage source here. I'd see a voltage at these terminals, open circuit with nothing connected to it. Right? And the faster I spun that machine, the higher that voltage would go. Okay. If I spun it in the opposite direction, the voltage would become negative, right? I'll try to show you that in class so you can kind of get a sense of, of what that looks like. Now, I derived this, I said, for an ideal machine. In reality, the machine probably has some losses associated with it. And so what I really get here at these terminals is, is not this ideal circuit, but I get really sort of a more complete, a more complete, Seven and equivalent, right? So looking into these terminals, the equivalent circuit I get would be some open circuit voltage, but there's also probably some losses inside this thing, okay? So a more complete model would basically be 
I probably have some resistance. And, you know, based on what I show that I've got wires wrapped around iron like I do, not to say that this is losses, but there's also probably some amount of inductance associated with this thing as well. Okay. If I just think about the fact that I'm looking into, if the motor's not spinning, I'm basically looking into a wire, right? And the wire must have some resistance and inductance. So the complete model for a motor is this, okay? Km omega. And you can kind of see right now, if the motor is not spinning, this voltage source right here, okay, would be shorted out. And I would just be looking at a wire with some resistance and some inductance. So notice real quick, this guy here is actually a, look at that, a dependent source. A dependent source. So in reality, it looks like this guy is a speed dependent voltage source. So the voltage I create is dependent upon speed. All right. So you know the idea of dependent sources is clearly a, a pretty pretty important one. All right. <clears throat> what this models now is, is what the machine looks like electrically. Now this doesn't show the full mechanical interface. I need to add that part in, but this shows the way this guy sort of behaves. All right. So in reality, what I do is, you know, when you're when you're working in the in um, this assignment, what you're doing is you typically would have a DC voltage source, and then you have your H bridge. All right, or your motor drive, and you would hook the output of that up to VA, and you would you would operate this H bridge to adjust this voltage up and down. Okay, and if I if I take this voltage higher, then the machine should spin faster, and if I take the current IA, if I take that up, then this thing will produce more torque. Okay, so. These two critical relationships are, are still true. So torque is always directly related to current. And the voltage I apply to the terminals, more voltage ultimately means more speed. All right? It is not true that VA directly equals K omega. All right? That's true if the machine is operating it as a generator and it's completely open circuited. If there's any amount of current flowing in here, VA is going to be a little bit higher than Km omega, but it's still the case that if this voltage goes up, all right, what ultimately will end up happening is this this speed will go up. Okay. All right. Now, how do we how do we make use of this model? Okay. I've got part of what I need. All right. In, in looking at this, I've got part of what I need. The other part I need is I need to understand the mechanical interface. To do that, I have to go back a little bit to Newton's laws. Okay. So I'm going to go back to Newton's second law. All right. And you guys should know Newton's second law as the net force on an object is equal to its mass times acceleration or mass times the rate at which speed changes. Okay. So let's think about this in the context of, I'm going to draw a really bad picture here of a stick figure person. All right. A stick figure person, all right, who is pushing a block, all right, along a surface. Okay. So <clears throat> what we know is that if the person pushes this block, there's going to be basically an F. What I'll say is F uh, applied, right, by the person, and because I'm pushing this thing against the ground there's going to be an F friction along the bottom, along the surface. <clears throat> All right. Now, in steady state, if a person is pushing this object along the surface, the definition of steady state would mean constant velocity. All right. In other words, this guy's moving at a constant rate of speed. So a constant velocity, meaning dv by dt, is equal to zero. In that particular case, right? What should be the case is that the force that's applied by the person is exactly opposite the force of friction trying to slow this thing down. All right. So the way we deal with this, as I say, in this particular scenario, the net force, 
right? the net force is equal to the force applied. I put that in the plus direction, the positive direction, because I'm trying to force this thing forward. And I say the force of friction operates in the opposite direction, minus F friction. That's equal to mass times dv by dt. Okay? If it's the case that I'm in steady state, so like I said, in steady state, V equals a constant, okay, and dV by dt equals zero. So that means that F applied, F applied equals F friction, right, in terms of their magnitude. And so dV by dt is zero. In other words, I'm applying exactly enough force as I need to fight back against the friction to move at a constant speed. Okay, So this relationship, Newton's second law, is sort of the critical and important relationship that I, that I need to be able to describe how this motor works. All right? Now, <clears throat> what, that, what that means, okay, just you know, a couple, couple of critical things here. Anytime I get derivatives like this in any system, like over here, right? If I looked at, if I did a KVL around this circuit right here, real quick, right? if I did a KVL around my circuit, one of the things I'd find is that VA equals IA RA plus LA DIA by DT plus KM omega, right? That is what I get from doing a KVL around that loop. We know that anytime I have derivatives like this, this implies energy storage or in other words dynamic system behavior right that energy storage causes the system to be dynamic in other words this circuit opposes a change in current right the 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 fact that it's storing magnetic energy in the magnetic field you know, stored within this inductor. That magnetic field doesn't like to change instantaneously, and so this energy storage element opposes the change in current, right? which causes this dynamic behavior. Well, over here, right, on the force side, the mechanical side, it looks like I've got the same thing. In other words, there is energy storage, energy storage in the mass. Okay, so I'm going to apply this to the case of the motor, but this is an important thing I want to remember, right? Is this mechanical system, because I have a mass over here, there's energy storage in it, just like there's energy storage in this inductance. All right, well now, so let's think back here. Let's think how I can use Newton's second law in, in the context of a rotational system, right? So Newton's second law, F net, the net force on an object is equal to the mass times acceleration. Well, in a rotational form, right, you should have seen this in physics. In a rotational form, what I have is not the mass, but what we call the moment of inertia times the rate of change of angular acceleration is equal to the torque net, the net torque applied. So if I take a cylinder, all right, so let's say I have a cylinder like this rotor here. All right, and that cylinder has a length L, okay, and it has a mass M, and it has a radius R, right? I can figure out what we call a moment of inertia of that thing, right? And a moment of inertia for something like this is one half M R squared, all right? So we define sort of a moment of inertia as sort of a rotational equivalent of, of mass, okay? So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail about that. All right, you can go back to your physics book to try to remember that. All right, but the important thing is I need to know that parameter to understand what this thing is. Okay. <clears throat> In a rotational form, what I, what I do is I write Newton's second law as moment of inertia times acceleration is equal to net torque. Right, just like we said, net force is mass times acceleration. Net torque is moment of inertia times angular acceleration, right? 
Net force is mass times acceleration. Net torque is moment of inertia times angular acceleration. Okay. So in, in the example of me pushing the block, I said, okay, well, the net force is equal to the force applied by me to push the block minus the force of friction working against me. Well, okay, so in this particular case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the net torque on a motor is the torque applied to make the motor move, okay, minus the torque of friction that works against it, okay. Now that torque of friction, this depends on the type of load, so it depends on the mechanical load, okay. In other words, if it's a pump, it's a fan, if it's a, a motor arm, depends on the type of mechanical, mechanical load. Okay. So it depends on the type of mechanical load, but generally speaking, this guy ends up being proportional to speed in some way. Okay. So very often that torque of friction, we usually write it as some constant times speed like that. Okay. And again, it can be more complicated. I'm not going to talk about that. We don't need to really get into all of those details. right? But basically what this says is the faster I try to go, the more friction I get. Right? You guys saw that in physics, right? So if I had looked at this problem in physics, the friction you would have said was basically some constant times the, the speed at which you were trying to move. It's similar in a rotational context. Now the torque applied is basically the torque of electrical origin, basically the torque that's coming from that current that I'm putting in. So I said way back at the beginning, torque is related to current. So I say the torque applied is equal to Km Ia. All right. And so with that, I now have the two equations I need to understand the motor. Basically from KVL on the electrical system. Okay. From KVL on the electrical system. So as I went around this circuit here, so this circuit here, ah. Okay. So as I went around this circuit here, I ended up with VA, the voltage applied, equals IA. R A plus L A D I A D T. So L A D I A by D T plus K M omega. And now from the mechanical side, so from Newton, I have my mechanical stuff. So I have J D omega dt equals um, Km Ia minus beta omega. All right. Now, those two things right here, if I look at, at, at the way this guy operates, Va here, this is my input. In other words, what I ultimately input to the system is a voltage. Okay, I input a voltage. What current flows? Well, the current that flows ultimately depends on whatever I need to turn the load. So the current is actually related to whatever the heck is going on in the mechanical system. So this is kind of a complicated little circuit. It's not that hard to understand. But basically, the amount of current that's drawn out of this voltage source depends on how much torque I ultimately need. All right, so just to kind of understand that for a second, right? Let's assume I've applied a, a voltage. If I go through this, and you guys will do this in your project, is let's say that VA is a step in voltage. All right, so let's say I apply 12 volts all of a sudden to the motor. Well, if I do that, and I solve through all these equations, what I'm going to find is that the current and the, and the speed, so let's look at the speed. What would the speed do? Well, the speed would look like this. The speed would come to some steady state value, is what these equations basically tell me. Right? If all of a sudden this beta value changed, now what would cause that beta value to change? 
Well, what would cause that beta value to change might be if, let's say all of a sudden I grab the shaft of the motor or something like that. If I grab the shaft of the motor, so grab shaft of motor, all right, beta will increase, all right? And so essentially the force of friction is going to increase, all right? So as a result of that, What's going to happen is this. So J d omega dt is equal to Km Ia minus beta omega. So if all of a sudden beta goes up, what's going to happen is the current doesn't change right away. So the torque applied is going to be less than this torque of friction. right? And that says that the net torque is less than zero. So as a result, the speed of this guy is going to decrease a little bit. Okay, the speed of this guy is going to decrease ultimately a little bit. All right. Now looking at the circuit, here's V A R A L A. Here's K M omega. So. Initially, because the net torque on this thing is less than zero, that means this thing needs to decelerate. The acceleration is less than zero. If the acceleration is negative, this thing is going to slow down. So omega drops. Okay. If omega drops, and I look at this circuit, right? In this particular circuit, what I see is that right, IA is equal to, now let's, unless I use impedance, it's a little bit hard to see this, right? But if, if omega goes down, let me write it this way, if omega goes down, then this voltage source right here will also, this voltage source right here will also go down. That means the voltage across RA, LA like that's going to go up, right? That ultimately means that IA increases, okay? IA will increase until eventually this term, the torque applied, and now the, the torque of friction become equal to each other again, and the speed stops changing. Okay, So <clears throat> what I would see if I looked at the current, right, is the current would probably rise like this, and then ultimately rise a little bit right there when the speed drops. Okay, Your job in, in the assignment basically is to combine these relationships. Okay. VA is my input. Speed is my output. Okay. You guys can work out a transfer function from this input voltage to this output speed by taking the Laplace transform of these guys and making some substitutions. All right. It's not, not too difficult to do that. All right. So that explains a little bit about how the DC motor works. Um, I'll upload some accompanying notes. Um, in addition to this, I'm going to upload a video that shows a little bit of the critical principles about how the DC machine responds to sort of a, a changing frequency at its input, right? And how, it, how if the frequency is high enough, it won't respond to um, the, the high frequency. It'll only respond to the average component, the DC component. All right, so these equations are really the ones that I need to understand the motor. There's nothing else that you ever remember about motors. Have it be these two things, right? That if I apply more current to the machine, it will produce more torque, okay? If I apply more voltage to the machine, it will go faster, okay? Right? The way it works basically is all shown here. I apply a voltage to this thing. It gets going to a particular speed, right? It stays at a constant speed, meaning that the net torque is equal to zero. In other words, the machine is producing exactly enough torque, KMIA, to balance this beta omega. If I grab the shaft, beta goes up, and the net torque is less than zero, so this thing slows down, and the current goes up. All right, so we'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll upload um, some additional videos that kind of show this and show some of that in, in class.